How does money interact with happiness and are old studies inaccurate? I'm Marco Perry. Welcome to the Perry Platform. SciPost writes that research has suggested earning more money makes people happier until about $75,000 a year. Then, higher salaries are no longer associated with greater well-being. But, there have been some recent findings that were published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences that suggest perhaps the opposite is true. That well-being increases steadily with money and does not plateau. The original theory went something like this. There is a fundamental level of wealth that somebody needs to stave off all of the horrors of poverty. If you're not making at least $75,000 a year, there are certain considerations that will be in your mind that those in the higher income bracket just won't have to deal with, especially on the lower end of that. Where is your next meal coming from? Can you afford to entertain yourself tonight? Can you send your children to post-secondary institutions? All of these things and the compounding effect of having to question the legitimacy and practicality of those things in your life resulted in a lower well-being. Now, let's say you did manage to get to this threshold, the 75k a year. The studies indicated that once you made it there, you essentially experienced a rapidly diminishing return on your money earned. An additional dollar at that point isn't really staving off all these intense demons. It might help you get an extra vacation, but... You're going to be okay without it. And because of that, once you hit this certain milestone, one must look to other avenues and places to increase well-being. Money just doesn't cut it any more for you. It's going to keep you alive. It's going to keep your family safe and healthy. But to seek out a deeper sense of meaning and purpose, there has to be something beyond that. Now, as mentioned, a new study has emerged that is showing that perhaps this is incorrect. Your well-being might in fact keep scaling and does not plateau. This new method fundamentally had a different approach to studying these effects between money and happiness or well-being. The previous studies did something where they tried to calculate your overall life satisfaction. Now, this new method did things differently. They quantified your day-to-day well-being and they layered on your income brackets on top of that. They found that people who earned more money reported greater day-to-day well-being and better overall life satisfaction. And the relationship was linear. They found that it did not plateau at $75,000 and the slope remained intact for brackets above that range. Now, a couple points here. The fundamental difference it seems like between the two studies is time frame. In the initial, your overall life satisfaction. In this newer one, day to day and from this more honed in frame the day to day the results are different now i wonder if this is just a matter of scope when we're forced to examine the day-to-day annoyances that we all have to deal with there are plenty being late for public transit maybe the richer you are these things evaporate because you're riding around in your uber personal driver your limo or just driving yourself to work having to deal with crappy lunches because you couldn't make a better one in the morning. Well, maybe those who are richer don't have to deal with that, and the richer you get, the better your lunches can be. But if you phrase the question more in terms of your overall life satisfaction, these minor inconveniences that definitely impact your day-to-day, they drop off. If somebody was to ask me how was my day today, I would consider all those annoyances, and that would impact my response to you. But if someone were to ask me how is my overall life satisfaction, it's a very different question. Those small things fall off and you begin to look big picture. How is the health of your family? How is your overall career progression looking? How are your relationships? How are things you care about? The fact that the subway was delayed this morning wouldn't factor into that equation, and I do think that is where the difference is fundamentally lying here. Perhaps it's just a case that when you do get to something like $75,000, the big picture items in your life do not differ that much. And you have to look at other means than just money to make these things increase or decrease. But the day-to-day annoyances that you deal with, those perhaps are scaling more linearly with money. 
in the overarching narrative of one's life, you're typically going to be evaluating that in terms of the good deeds you've done, the things you've built, the legacy you've left behind. Money is needed to establish a rough bedrock to enable you to pursue these things, but when I start to quantify well-being on a day-to-day -day basis, money might alleviate some of the current needs like me wanting to go on vacation right now or me wanting to go to an all-you-can-eat steak place right now. Not having an exorbitant amount of money that would enable me to act on these daily whims would perhaps alter my responses to the question if they're framed that way. Now, having said that, there was a master variable that the study found. This question was responsible for the vast majority of the relationship between income and day-to-day well-being. And that question was, to what extent do you feel in control of your life? It explains 74% of the relationship between income and day-to-day well-being. The more control you felt, the better your well-being. And money seems to be the predominant regulating force there. The more money you have, the more control you feel. And that makes sense. But there's still that question of at what point does it plateau, if it does. It's totally reasonable to expect somebody who is on the poverty line to not feel in control of their life. They're paycheck to paycheck. There's a bunch of uncertainty. They can't even think about the future. Now, somebody making $75,000 a year, are they going to be feeling more control? Well, more so than that first example, that's for sure. But compare somebody making 250 k to somebody making 300 k How much more control are they going to feel? Now, the poverty line to 75 k that's roughly a difference of $50,000. 250 to 300 k is also a difference of $50,000. So, the distance between the two parties relatively, it's the same. But the consequences are vastly different because on one hand, you have a dichotomy where we're talking about not being able to sustain yourself with the basic necessities of life. Now, on the other hand, maybe it's a question of being able to buy an extra gold watch. In this regard, we can make the case that the absolute impact on your well-being does taper off. But maybe the relative impact doesn't. Maybe those individuals in the very high brackets are attributing their self-worth to their status in the, social circle, in the social circle. And if they can't afford that extra gold watch, they become as miserable as the person who's paycheck to paycheck. Perhaps that's possible. Perhaps you're anchoring yourself to others so deeply that that occurs. And therefore, there's always that desire to get that extra dollar, to move higher and higher up. But as you do that, you begin to compare yourself to people who are also higher and higher up. Maybe you're at first comparing yourself to your peers from high school. And then you're comparing yourself to the C-suite executives. And then you're comparing yourself to the elites at your country golf club. And it keeps going up. While the utility of every extra dollar that you earn is clearly different than the utility it offers somebody who is within poverty limits, to you, the subjective impact of that extra dollar might still be the same psychologically. The shame that one feels by not being able to provide themselves a proper dinner might, in relative terms, be comparable to the shame that one feels by not being able to engage in the extravagancies of all their peers. Humans are fundamentally comparative creatures, and that's how we gauge success. The question is, who are you comparing yourself to? That's a big question. The average Canadian comparing themselves to the global standard is going to make you feel pretty privileged. You're quite literally in the top 1% in that regard. Now, the average Canadian comparing themselves to other Canadians, they're definitely not, not going to feel that way. Now, the average Canadian comparing themselves to the top 1% within Canada, they're definitely not going to feel privileged by any means. And the top 1% in Canada comparing themselves to the top 0.5% are not going to feel privileged either. There is a need for perspective here because you can do the geography game. That will make you realize quickly how lucky you are. Look around the world. And there's also the historical game. Look at humans who are living in the 1600s and compare that with your standard of living now. It's quite crazy how blessed we are. But we're quick to overlook it because we see those who are perhaps more blessed. And there's always going to be individuals who are better off. That's a given. But the comparison game that we play has to be calibrated. Otherwise, a miserable existence and a continued pursuit of that extra dollar will always occur. Interestingly enough, the findings of this new study also suggest that money does not necessarily make everyone happier, 
it makes a lot of people happier, but a person's mindset around money also matters. If you're somebody who generally equates money with success, overall these people were less happy compared to people who didn't do that. The more people equated money and success because it is a sort of spectrum, the lower their experience well-being was on average. So perceptions matter here. Philosophy matters here. So think about it. How important is money actually to you? At a fundamental level, we're just talking about pieces of paper here. What you really want is the things that money gets you. The opportunity, the goods, the experiences. No one person can take every action and have everything, so you have to have an inherent hierarchy here. What matters most to you? Think about that. And do the things that matter most to you, are they already in your possession? Would more money make them more tangible? More real? Maybe. Maybe not. If you dial things back again to looking at your well-being overall in life and the things that you want to accomplish before your time is up, maybe it begins to dawn on you that there are other things, other mechanisms of success that are more appropriate and more applicable to attaining them. You want a great family? Well, I can imagine how the pursuit of money would derail that. You want to improve your community? Once again, I can imagine how the singular pursuit of money could derail that. You want to have an impact on those around you? Once again, same situation. Don't get me wrong, though. There's nothing wrong inherently with pursuing money, but there has to be other guiding principles and factors as part of the equation. Why are you doing that? If you don't have a why, well, the exercise is pointless in and of itself. I'll close off with this question. I've been thinking about it a little bit lately. The question is, what do you give your life to? That might sound strange, but it's something that we all do. Everyone on this planet gives their life to something. Even now, you're giving a portion of your life to listening to this podcast. Later, you'll give a portion of your life to preparing the type of dinner that's available to you. You'll give a larger portion of your life, perhaps, to studying something or working somewhere. Then there are even larger goals than that. People who have dedicated themselves to a lifelong ambition, that's what they've given their life to. The tragic news here, or maybe it's not tragic depending on how you want to look at it, is that you don't have an infinite amount of time to give. So you better use it wisely. If your answer to this question, what do you give your life to, is money, I think you've made a mistake. Money is never going to be enough. It's an endless pursuit. An endless pursuit that will never be satisfying to you. Now, I'll caveat that. Sure, money enables you to do other things, and there's no problem with that, but it can't be your primary response to what you've given your life to. If you've given your life to supporting your children, then yes, money will play a role there, but money is simply a mechanism to attaining the actual why or the what, in this case. Maximize it within reason, but always remember your why. Always think about what you're giving your life to, and if it's going to matter at the end of the day. In the blink of an eye, you'll find yourself in your 50s, toiling away at an office job, perhaps, that you hate. And you'll be wondering, what have I given my life to? And if you've given it to the mindless accumulation of money, the mindless day-to-day -day activities that occur at this job, I can guarantee you're not going to feel fulfilled. But if you had a mission in mind, if you went through all of that boring suffering, toiling away for a reason that matters to you, then you will be able to find fulfillment. If you don't think about this, well, the world will force an answer upon you. Everyone gives their life to something. And if you haven't thought about what that's going to be for you, well... Your default answer will be nothingness, or if you're lucky, you'll stumble upon something, but taking the initiative here is far more preferable. The findings of this study are interesting. They find that for most people, your well-being will increase steadily and will not plateau. Every dollar you make is going to keep making your well-being increase, at least to you. But is that how we should be operating? We know a couple other things too. It seems like you're 
perception of money is going to play a role on your happiness and your well-being indicators. If you're tying that pursuit of money to success, well, you're going to be less happy overall compared to those who don't. And I actually do think that if you let this game ride out, you do become a high earner one day. You're making $300,000. And still, at this point, every extra dollar is giving you the same increase in well-being as it did when you were making 30000 You may have to reevaluate the ways in which you're operating, the ways in which you're viewing this game. You may have to reevaluate what you're giving your life to. It shouldn't have that impact on you. There has to be a point at which we reach this level of enough. And anything beyond the enough starts to diminish rapidly. Because making very little tangible differences in your life, it's no longer a matter of being able to provide for yourself and your family. It's no longer a matter of choosing to go hungry or not. It becomes matters of extravagance. And of course, I'll layer on a dose of realism here. Perhaps the old study was simply outdated due to things like inflation. Maybe 75000 isn't enough anymore for you to start experiencing a decline in utility. Maybe that number is closer to 100000 now because you can't afford a house where you live if you don't make that kind of money. Because the prices of everything have skyrocketed. Then sure, there is some tinkering that could be done to the metrics. But still, the fundamental point stands there has to be a plateau. And if there is no plateau, then we have a serious problem. In a situation like that, it would be money that rules you and not you ruling over it. And for an inanimate object that society has to place arbitrary value onto, that is actually quite unfortunate. And with that, it does bring us to the end of our conversation for today. If you enjoyed the conversation, be sure to leave a review and share to help us grow. And you can find me online at periplatform.org and on social media at Perry Platform. Thanks for joining me and I'll see you soon.